All right, hello everyone. Um, this is our lecture on the cell, um, and that's the basis of our next unit. So grab your cell notes handout and let's get started. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about some history first, some of the early uh, contributions to what we understand about cells, and this goes way back. Um, the first person that we uh, we talk about is a guy named Robert Hooke. Um, he was the first person to see cells, although he did not call them that at the time. He was looking at cork, which, um, if you know what that is, that's the uh, it comes from tree bark, um, um, and he was uh, looking uh, at uh, at um, some uh, cork, and he saw these tiny little squares. Um, we call them little boxes, um, and that was back in 1665, which is a long even before I was born. Um, so a long time ago. Um, he was the first person to see cells. And then the next person that we uh, we uh, talk about is a guy named Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Um, he saw living cells. So the, the cork cells that uh, Hook looked at, um, cork is not alive, but von, uh, von Leeuwenhoek was looking at pond water. And he saw tiny little animals or animalcules, that means little animal, um, in the pond water. That was in 1673. And so that was the first living cell that uh, somebody saw. Um, our next uh, contributor that we want to talk about is Theodore Schwann. Um, he was a zoologist in 1839, and he figured out or realized that the tissues of, so the tissues of animal cells, sorry, the tissues of animals have cells, are made of cells. Um, when Van Leeuwenhoek was uh, making his observation, he was looking at single-celled organisms um, swimming around in pond water. Um, so it was another uh, leap, and like 150 years or so later, before anyone realized that actually that organs and tissues of animals were made up of cells, just like those single-celled organisms. Um, and then uh, sh uh, shortly thereafter, Matthias Schleiden uh, was a botanist, came to the same realization regarding plant cells. They also, I'm sorry, plants are also made up cells. So um, by 1845, uh, scientists realized that plant and animals are made up of cells. And uh, Rudolf Virchow sort of pulled it together a little bit and reported that, figured out that every living thing is made up of cells. And he predicted that cells come from other cells. Now, we know that now. It's obvious to us these at this point. But back in 1850, that was a, that was a revelation. All right, so that brings us to the cell theory, which is the basic uh, idea that was pulled together from those observations. Three components of the cell theory. One, every living organism is made up of one or more cells. There are single-celled organisms, and there are multicellular organisms like us. But either way, single or many, you're made up of cells. The cell is the basic unit of structure and function in biology. So a cell is the simplest thing that you can have and still ha have it call it alive. <clears throat> and then the third uh, piece is that all cells arise from pre-existing cells, which of course uh, begs the question, well, where did the first cell come from? And we will talk about that a little bit when we get to our evolution piece about how, um, uh, what our different theories for the origin of life are. All right, so that's your cell theory. Um, we can divide cells into two basic types, uh, the prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic cell. Uh, we'll talk about both of them, all right? So the prokaryotes, let's start with the prokaryotic cells. These are very simple cells. They were the first organisms to uh, inhabit the planet. Um, um, the, this is uh, um, uh, uh, things like bacteria, right, are prokaryotes. They're, um, they don't contain um, uh, a nucleus like we have, a our cells have nucleus, nuclei. Um, the DNA that you find inside a prokaryote is circular, and it's not contained in a membrane-bound nucleus. We're going to talk about what that phrase means a little bit more in a second. <clears throat> All right, so prokaryotes do not contain membrane-bound nuclei, and their DNA is circular. Um, there are some other features that are that are typical for prokaryotes, although not every bacteria or prokaryote contains all of these. But one example is a flagella. It's kind of like a tail. Here's a flagella right here. And um, uh, um, these organisms will use their flagella for movement. So they can 
whip this around and, and propel themselves. Um, another um, uh, characteristic that you'll find in prokaryotes is called a pilus. The plural of that word is pili, P-I-L-I. These are small hair-like structures. You see them here, right? These little red lines. Um, and these are useful for attaching to other cells or to attaching to uh, a substrate of some kind sticking down. Um, so they hold themselves in place with pili. And then um, some bacteria, some prokaryotes, but not all, will have a, an outer capsule. It's like a layer uh, around the outside of the cell. Um, of course, the flagella would stick through it, but anyway, um, an outer layer that protects the bacteria. These are often found on bacteria that are harmful to organisms like ourselves. So harmful bacteria are often uh, protected by this outer capsule. All right, so that's the basics of a prokaryote. The other kind of cell type we'll talk about is a eukaryotic cell. These are more advanced. These are the kinds of cells that you find in us, multicellular organisms. There are also single-celled organisms that are eukaryotes. For example, yeast are eukaryotic cells. Single cell, but more advanced. These are more advanced than prokaryotes. Um, you find them in plants and animals and single-celled organisms called protists. This is probably what um, Van Leeuwenhoek was looking at when he saw animalcules. Eukaryotic cells have a membrane-bound organelles. So we've talked a little bit about the organelles that you find inside um, cells already when we talked about the mitochondria and the chloroplast in the last unit. Um, we're going to talk more about those kinds of organelles uh, now. So um, what distinguishes a eukaryotic, one of the key distinguishers uh, between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is the presence of organelles that are membrane bound or surrounded by a membrane like a skin. Um, so here's the mitochondria. It's a membrane bound organelle because it's wrapped in a membrane. Um, we don't have a chloroplast on here. So um, all the organelles that you find inside a eukaryotic cell are membrane bound. So let's uh, talk about those different organelles. So the nucleus is an organelle that you find inside eukaryotic cells, and that's where the DNA of uh, a cell is contained. Um, and so we like to think of the uh, nucleus as a control center um, for the cell. It directs the actions of the cell. All right, so nucleus. Um, so uh, the, the, a eukaryotic cell has an internal structure um, and that's what we're going to talk about now, the internal structure or the framework inside the cell. So there are three components we want to talk about. The first is called cytoplasm. And um, uh, it's like the jelly filling inside a donut, inside a, a jelly-filled donut. Um, there's a goo inside the cell, and that's called the cytoplasm. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as cytosol, C-Y-T-O-S-O-L. Um, but the, correct, the more correct term is cytoplasm. So that's like the filling inside the cell, and it's a liquid, um, and lots and lots of important reactions take place inside the cytoplasm. Um, I bet you didn't know that cells had skeletons like you have a skeleton. Now, their skeletons aren't made of bone. They're made of proteins. Um, we call it a cytoskeleton. Um, we're trying to represent that here with like this blue tube-looking thing, and there's another one here, and there's a few of them down here. They... Um, there's a framework or a support structure inside the cell, and it's made up of proteins, and it's called a cytoskeleton. All right, and that's what gives the cell its shape. And then, of course, cells are surrounded by a membrane. All right, that's what separates the cell from its environment. So it's the outer boundary of the cell. Um, and But the membrane is more than just a barrier. It's a it's like a gatekeeper. It allows certain things to cross itself, cross the membrane, and other things not. So there's actually a term for that. Um, the term is selectively permeable. Selective means choosing. Permeable means allowing things to cross. So a membrane is selectively permeable because it allows certain compounds and uh, molecules and proteins and so on to cross the membrane, and others cannot cross. So the, the membrane uh, determines what gets in and out of the cell. Okay. Now, um, protein production is the next thing that we want to talk about. It's possible to think about the cell as a factory, and the purpose of this factory is to make proteins. Why? Well, proteins are what do all this work 
that a cell and an organism need done. So protein production is the job, an important job inside a cell. So we can think of the cell as a factory. The product is protein, and, the, and those proteins either serve the pur some purpose inside the body or some purpose inside the cell itself. Um, and that, what that is depends on the particular cell. All right, so the instructions for how to build a given protein, and there are hundreds of thousands of different proteins, the instructions to build those are found in the DNA. Um, so DNA is kind of like a blueprint or a, or a recipe, and um, the protein is the product or the, the, the thing that you cook. Um, uh, but you can think of the DNA as the instructions on how to make a given protein. And um, the place where that protein actually gets made is called the ribosome. It's a, an organelle that you find in the cytoplasm, right, floating around inside the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, lots and lots of, of ribosomes inside one cell. And each one of the ribosomes is like a little protein factory. It reads um, the DNA instructions, and it makes the protein. All right, so that's the purpose of a ribosome. It's a protein production plant. Ribosomes build a protein, and when they're finished with it, they send it to another organelle. So, so here's the, um, it's a little hard to see maybe, but these are supposed to be ribosomes right here. And that red line is, is a, um, between right here is a, a, a message, um, the instructions for building the protein that came from the DNA inside the nucleus. And um, the ribosomes are making the protein. It's the protein right here. And that protein, after it's made, can go to another organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum, which I always thought was a great name, but we abbreviate that to ER. So the endoplasmic reticulum um, can modify the protein, change it, add pieces to it, um, and then when it's finished there, it goes to another organelle, which we don't show on this picture, called the Golgi. And the Golgi is kind of like um, the FedEx delivery system. It delivers proteins to where they need to go, packages them up, and ships them off to where they need to be. So proteins go to the Golgi, and they can be finished off, they're tagged, maybe they get sent out of the cell, maybe they get sent to a specific place inside the cell, but that um, sending process, that delivery process happens in the Golgi. All right, so that's how, cell that's how cells make proteins. Now I'm hoping that this slide is pretty familiar because we just came off the unit talking about energetics. So energy in the cell should be something you guys are comfortable with. We have two main organelles that produce energy. One is called the chloroplast. That's here. You only find that in plants. Chloroplasts capture um, light energy and convert it into chemical energy using the process of photosynthesis. And um, then the other um, energetics uh, relevant uh, organelle is called the mitochondria. And you find that in plants and in animals. And here's a picture of one. This should look very familiar because we just took a test on it a couple days ago. Um, this is where cellular respiration happens. The sugar that comes from photosynthesis gets broken down and the energy is stored as ATP. Hopefully that's all very familiar. All right. Now, how do we distinguish what are the differences between a plant cell and an animal cell? Let's talk about a plant cell. Plant cells have all the same things that an animal cell has plus more. All right, so they're more complicated than animal cells. It's my dog. Come here. All right, um, so there are three main um, additions that plant cells have, which animal cells do not. The first is the chloroplast. Plants have chloroplasts, animals do not. All right, and we know what a chloroplast does. Another difference between plants and animal cells is the cell wall. Animal cells do not have a cell wall. Plant cells do. What is it? It's an outside layer around the outside of the plant cell. Um, it is, and it's kind of like, back, it's kind of, um, I, I'm sorry, you find them in bacteria too, and it's kind of like a support structure. It's um, stiff, it's made of um, tough proteins, and it's like a, a, an additional layer on the outside of the, of the plant cell that provides support. All right. The third difference between plant and animal cells um, is the central vacuole, and that's this kind of darker greenish area here. All right, it's labeled vacuole, but it's actually called a central vacuole, right? It's basically a, a water reservoir. It's like a plastic bag filled that gets filled with water. And um, 
it helps the plant maintain stiffness, which is what we call turgor. All right. So if you've ever grown a plant, um, you know that you have to water it because if you don't water it, it gets limp and eventually it'll die. Right. But they'll wilt first. They'll get they'll get kind of flabby and and they'll flop over and then they'll die. Um, that flopping over get uh, the limp wilting thing comes from their central vacuoles running out of water. So a plant cell will pump water into its into this central vacuole and fill that up with water, fill this central vacuole up with water so that it expands inside the cell and it presses up against the cell wall. And that makes the plant cell stiff. And that's how plants can you know, grow tall and hold their leaves up and stuff because their central vacuoles are full of water. And that's how they maintain that, that, that characteristic called turgor. Alrighty. So here is a quick compare and contrast image for plant cells versus animal cells. Um, anything that a plant that an animal cell has, a plant cell has plus more. Okay, so remember the key difference, key additions, the uh, chloroplast, the cell wall, and the central vacuole. You'll find those in plants, but you won't find those in animals. All right, so the last page on your um, uh, notes handout is already filled out. It's this cell organelles chart. Um, and it lists a whole bunch of organelles here in the left hand column um, where you find it, plant or animal, and what it does and what it looks like. So um, you've got location, description, and function. You should become very familiar with this chart. This is a, um, and um, flashcards are a most excellent way to learn organelles, their and their functions. Um, so you're going to be expected to know these things. So it's all summarized here. However you choose to study that and prepare, uh, that's up to you, but here's the information. So um, that's the end of our uh, um, uh, cell, uh, cell notes, and so I hope that helped, and we will debrief it uh, next time in class. Thank you.